Chapter Three. At half past twelve next day, Lord Henry Wotton strolled from Curzon Street over to the Albany to call on his uncle, Lord Fermor, a genial, if somewhat rough mannered old bachelor, whom the outside world called selfish because it derived no particular benefit from him but who was considered generous by society as he fed the people who amused him his father had been our ambassador at madrid when isabella was young and prim unthought of but had retired from the diplomatic service in a capricious moment of annoyance on not being offered the embassy at paris a post to which he considered that he was fully entitled by reason of his birth his indolence the good english of his dispatches and his inordinate passion for pleasure the son who had been his father's secretary had resigned along with his chief somewhat foolishly as was thought at the time and on succeeding some months later to the title had set himself to the serious study of the great aristocratic art of doing absolutely nothing he had two large town-houses but preferred to live in chambers as it was less trouble and took most of his meals at his club he paid some attention to the management of his collieries in the midland counties excusing himself for this taint of industry on the ground that the one advantage of having coal was that it enabled a gentleman to afford the decency of burning wood on his own hearth in politics he was a tory except when the tories were in office during which period he roundly abused them for being a pack of radicals he was a hero to his valet who bullied him and a terror to most of his relations whom he bullied in turn only england could have produced him and he always said that the country was going to the dogs his principles were out of date but there was a good deal to be said for his prejudices when lord henry entered the room he found his uncle sitting in a rough shooting-coat smoking a cheroot and grumbling over the times well harry said the old gentleman what brings you out so early i thought your dandies never got up till two and were not visible till five pure family affection i assure you uncle george i want to get something out of you money i suppose said lord fermor making a wry face well sit down tell me about it young people nowadays imagine that money is everything yes murmured lord henry settling his buttonhole in his coat and when they grow older they know it but i don't want money it is only people who pay their bills who want that uncle george and i never pay mine credit is the capital of a younger son and one lives charmingly upon it besides i always deal with dartmoor's tradesmen and consequently they never bother me what i want is information not useful information of course useless information well i can tell you anything that is in the english blue book harry although those fellows nowadays write a lot of nonsense when i was in the diplomatic things were much better but i hear they let them in by examination what can you expect examination sir a pure humbug from beginning to end if a man is a gentleman he knows it quite enough and if he's not a gentleman whatever he knows is bad for him mr dorian gray does not belong to blue books uncle george said lord henry languidly mr dorian gray who is he asked lord fermor knitting his bushy white eyebrows that is what i have come to learn uncle george or rather i know who he is he is the last lord kelso's grandson his mother was a devereux lady margaret devereux i want you to tell me about his mother what was she like whom did she marry you have known nearly everybody in your time so you might have known her i am very much interested in mr gray at present i have only just met him kelso's grandson echoed the old gentleman kelso's grandson of course i knew his mother intimately i believe i was at her christening 
She was an extraordinarily beautiful girl, Margaret Devereux. They made all the men frantic by running away with a penniless young fellow. A mere nobody, sir, a subaltern and a foot regiment, or something of that kind. Certainly. I remember the whole thing as if it happened yesterday. The poor chap was killed in a duel at Spa a few months after the marriage. There was an ugly story about it. They said Kelso got some rascally adventurer, some Belgian brute, to insult his son-in-law in public. Paid him, sir, to do it. Paid him. And that the fellow spitted his man as if he had been a pigeon. The thing was hushed up, but he... Gad, Kelso ate his chop alone at the club for some time afterwards. He brought his daughter back with him, I was told, and she never spoke to him again. Oh, yes, it was a bad business. The girl died, too, died within a year. So she left a son, did she? I'd forgotten that. What sort of boy is he? If he is like his mother, he must be a good-looking chap. He is very good-looking, assented Lord Henry. I hope he will fall into proper hands continued the old man. He should have a pot of money waiting for him if Kelso did the right thing by him. His mother had money, too. All the Selby property came to her, through her grandfather. Her grandfather hated Kelso. Thought him a mean dog. He was, too. Came to Madrid once when I was there. Egad, I was ashamed of him. The Queen used to ask me about the English noble who was always quarrelling with the cabmen about their fares. They made quite a story of it. I didn't dare show my face at court for a month. I hope he treated his grandson better than he did the Jarvies. I don't know, answered Lord Henry. I fancy that the boy will be well off. He is not of age yet. He has Selby, I know. He told me so. And his mother was very beautiful. Margaret Devereux was one of the loveliest creatures I ever saw, Harry. What on earth induced her to behave as she did, I never could understand. She could have married anybody she chose. Carlington was mad after her. She was a romantic, though. All the women of the family were. The men were a poor lot, but he gad the women were wonderful. Carlington went on his knees to her. Told me so himself. She laughed at him. And there wasn't a girl in London at the time who wasn't after him. And by the way, Harry, talking about silly marriages, what is this humbug your father tells me about Dartmoor? Wanting to marry an American? Ain't English girls good enough for him? It is rather fashionable to marry Americans just now, Uncle George. I'll back English woman against the world, Harry, said Lord Fairmore, striking the table with his fist. The betting is on the Americans. They don't last, I'm told, muttered his uncle. A long engagement exhausts them, but they are capital at a steeplechase. They take things flying. I don't think Dartmoor has a chance. Who are her people? grumbled the old gentleman. Has she got any? Lord Henry shook his head. American girls are as clever at concealing their parents as English women are at concealing their past. They are pork-packers, I suppose. I hope so, Uncle George, for Dartmoor's sake. I am told that pork-packing is the most lucrative profession in America, after politics. Is she pretty? She behaves as if she was beautiful. Most American women do. It is the secret of their charm. Why can't these American women stay in their own country? They were always telling us that it is the paradise for women. It is. That is the reason why, like Eve, they are so excessively anxious to get out of it, said Lord Henry. Goodbye, Uncle George. I shall be late for lunch if I stop any longer. Thanks for giving me the information I wanted. I always like to know everything about my new friends and nothing about my old ones. Where are you lunching, Harry? At Aunt Agatha's. I have asked myself and Mr. Gray. He is her latest protégé. Tell your Aunt Agatha, Harry, not to bother me any more with her charity appeals. I am sick of them. Why, the good woman thinks I have nothing to do but write checks for her silly fads. All right, Uncle George, I'll tell her, but it won't have any effect. Philanthropic people lose all sense of humanity. It is their distinguishing characteristic. The old gentleman growled approvingly, and rang the bell for his servant. Lord Henry passed up the low arcade into Burlington Street, and turned his steps in the direction of Berkeley Square. So that was the story of Dorian Gray's parentage. Crudely as it had been told to him, it had yet stirred him by its suggestion of a strange, almost modern romance. A beautiful woman risking everything for a mad passion, a few wild weeks of happiness cut short by a hideous, treacherous crime. 
months of voiceless agony and then a child born in pain the mother snatched away by death the boy left to solitude and the tyranny of an old and loveless man yes it was an interesting background it posed the lad made him more perfect as it were behind every exquisite thing that existed there was something tragic worlds had to be in travail that the meanest flower might blow and how charming he had been at dinner the night before as with startled eyes and lips parted in frightened pleasure he had sat opposite to him at the club the red candle-shades staining to a richer rose the wakening wonder of his face talking to him was like playing upon an exquisite violin he answered to every touch and thrill of the bow there was something terribly enthralling in the exercise of influence no other activity was like it to project one's soul into some gracious form and let it tarry there for a moment to hear one's intellectual views echoed back to one with all the added music of passion and youth to convey one's temperament into another as though it were a subtle fluid or a strange perfume there was a real joy in that perhaps the most satisfying joy left to us in an age so limited and vulgar as our own an age grossly carnal in its pleasures and grossly common in its aims he was a marvellous type too this lad whom by so curious a chance he had met in basil's studio or could be fashioned into a marvellous type at any rate grace was his and the white purity of boyhood and beauty such as old greek marbles kept for us there was nothing that one could not do with him he could be made a titan or a toy what a pity it was that such beauty was destined to fade and basil from a psychological point of view how interesting he was the new manner in art the fresh mode of looking at life suggested so strangely by the merely visible presence of one who was unconscious of it all the silent spirit that dwelt in dim woodland and walked unseen in open field suddenly showing herself dryad-like and not afraid because in his soul who sought for her there had been wakened that wonderful vision to which alone are wonderful things revealed the mere shapes and patterns of things becoming as it were refined and gaining a kind of symbolical value as though they were themselves patterns of some other and more perfect form whose shadow they made real how strange it all was he remembered something like it in history was it not plato that artist in thought who had first analysed it was it not buonarotti who had carved it in the coloured marbles of a sonnet sequence but in our own century it was strange yes he would try to be to dorian gray what without knowing it the lad was to the painter who had fashioned the wonderful portrait he would seek to dominate him had already indeed half done so he would make that wonderful spirit his own there was something fascinating in this son of love and death suddenly he stopped and glanced up at the houses he found that he had passed his aunts some distance and smiling to himself turned back when he entered the somewhat sombre hall the butler told him that they had gone in to lunch 
he gave one of the footmen his hat and stick and passed into the dining-room late as usual harry cried his aunt shaking her head at him he invented a facile excuse and having taken the vacant seat next to her looked round to see who was there dorian bowed to him shyly from the end of the table a flush of pleasure stealing into his cheek opposite was the duchess of harley a lady of admirable good nature and good temper much liked by every one who knew her and of those ample architectural proportions that in women who are not duchesses are described by contemporary historians as stoutness next to her sat on her right sir thomas burden a radical member of parliament who followed his leader in public life and in private life followed the best cooks dining with the tories and thinking with the liberals in accordance with a wise and well-known rule the post on her left was occupied by mr erskine of treadley an old gentleman of considerable charm and culture who had fallen however into bad habits of silence having as he explained once to lady agatha said everything that he had to say before he was thirty his own neighbour was mrs vandeleur one of his aunt's oldest friends a perfect saint amongst women but so dreadfully dowdy that she reminded one of a badly bound hymn-book fortunately for him she had on the other side lord fordle a most intelligent middle-aged mediocrity as bald as a ministerial statement in the house of commons with whom she was conversing in that intensely earnest manner which is the one unpardonable error as he remarked once himself that all really good people fall into and from which none of them ever quite escape we are talking about poor dartmoor lord henry cried the duchess nodding pleasantly to him across the table do you think you will really marry this fascinating young person i believe she has made up her mind to propose to him duchess how dreadful exclaimed lady agatha really someone should interfere i am told on excellent authority that her father keeps an american dry-goods store said sir thomas burden looking supercilious my uncle has already suggested pork-packing sir thomas dry-goods what are american dry-goods asked the duchess raising her large hands in wonder and accentuating the verb american novels answered lord henry helping himself to some quail the duchess looked puzzled don't mind him my dear whispered lady agatha he never means anything that he says when america was discovered said the radical member and he began to give some wearisome facts like all people who try to exhaust a subject he exhausted his listeners the duchess sighed and exercised her privilege of interruption i wish to goodness it had never been discovered at all she exclaimed really our girls have no chance nowadays it is most unfair perhaps after all america never has been discovered said mr erskine i myself would say that it had merely been detected oh but i have seen specimens of the inhabitants answered the duchess vaguely i must confess that most of them are extremely pretty and they dress well too they get all their dresses in paris i wish i could afford to do the same they say that when good americans die they go to paris chuckled sir thomas who had a large wardrobe of humours cast off clothes really and where do bad americans go when they die inquired the duchess they go to america murmured lord henry sir thomas frowned i am afraid that your nephew is prejudiced against that great country he said to lady agatha i have travelled all over it in cars provided by the directors who in such matters are extremely civil i assure you it is an education to visit it but must we really see chicago in order to be educated 
asked mr erskine plaintively i don't feel up to the journey sir thomas waved his hand mr erskine of treadley has the world on his shelves we practical men like to see things not to read about them the americans are an extremely interesting people they are absolutely reasonable i think that is their distinguishing characteristic yes mr erskine and absolutely reasonable people i assure you there's no nonsense about the americans how dreadful cried lord henry i can stand brute force but brute reason is quite unbearable there is something unfair about its use it is hitting below the intellect i do not understand you said sir thomas growing rather red i do lord henry murmured mr erskine with a smile paradoxes are all very well in their way rejoined the baronet was that a paradox asked mr erskine i did not think so perhaps it was well the way of paradoxes is the way of truth to test reality we must see it on the tightrope when the verities become acrobats we can judge them dear me how you men argue said lady agatha i'm sure i never can make out what you are talking about oh harry i'm quite vexed with you why do you try to persuade our nice mr dorian gray to give up the east end i assure you he would be quite invaluable they would love his playing i want him to play to me cried lord henry smiling and he looked down the table and caught a bright answering glance but they are so unhappy in whitechapel continued lady agatha i can sympathize with everything except suffering said lord henry shrugging his shoulders i cannot sympathize with that it is too ugly too horrible too distressing there is something terribly morbid in the modern sympathy with pain one should sympathize with the color the beauty the joy of life the less said about life soars the better still the east end is a very important problem remarked sir thomas with a grave shake of the head quite so answered the young lord it is the problem of slavery and we try to solve it by amusing the slaves the politician looked at him keenly what change do you propose then he asked lord henry laughed <laughs> i don't desire to change anything in england except the weather he answered i am quite content with philosophic contemplation but as the nineteenth century has gone bankrupt through an over-expenditure of sympathy i would suggest that we should appeal to science to put us straight the advantage of the emotions is that they lead us astray and the advantage of science is that it is not emotional but we have such grave responsibilities ventured mrs vandeleur timidly terry be grief echoed lady agatha lord henry looked over at mr erskine humanity takes itself too seriously it is the world's original sin if the caveman had known how to laugh history would have been different you are really very comforting warbled the duchess i have always felt rather guilty when i came to see your dear aunt for i take no interest at all in the east end for the future i shall be able to look her in the face without a blush a blush is very becoming duchess remarked lord henry only when one is young she answered when an old woman like myself blushes it is a very bad sign ah lord henry i wish you would tell me how to become young again he thought for a moment can you remember any great error that you committed in your early days duchess he asked a great many i fear she cried then commit them over again he said gravely to get back one's youth one has merely to repeat one's follies a delightful theory she exclaimed i must put it into practice a dangerous theory came from sir thomas's tight lips lady agatha shook her head but could not help being amused mr erskine listened yes he continued that is one of the great secrets of life nowadays most people die of a sort of creeping common sense and discover when it is too late that the only things one never regrets are one's mistakes a laugh ran round the table he played with the idea and grew wilful tossed it into the air and transformed it let it escape and recaptured it 
made it iridescent with fancy and winged it with paradox the praise of folly as he went on soared into a philosophy and philosophy herself became young and catching the mad music of pleasure wearing one might fancy her wine-stained robe and wreath of ivy danced like a bacchante over the hills of life and mocked the slow silenus for being sober facts fled before her like frightened forest things her white feet trod the huge press at which wise omar sits till the seething grape-juice rose round her bare limbs in waves of purple bubbles or crawled in red foam over the vats black dripping sloping sides it was an extraordinary improvisation he felt that the eyes of dorian gray were fixed on him and the consciousness that amongst his audience there was one whose temperament he wished to fascinate seemed to give his wit keenness and to lend colour to his imagination he was brilliant fantastic irresponsible he charmed his listeners out of themselves and they followed his pipe laughing dorian gray never took his gaze off him but sat like one under a spell smiles chasing each other over his lips and wonder growing grave in his darkening eyes at last liveried in the costume of the age reality entered the room in the shape of a servant to tell the duchess that her carriage was waiting she wrung her hands in mock despair how annoying she cried i must go i have to call for my husband at the club to take him to some absurd meeting at willis's rooms where he is going to be in the chair if i am late he is sure to be furious and i couldn't have a scene in his bonnet it's far too fragile a harsh word would ruin it no i must go dear agatha good-bye lord henry you are quite delightful and dreadfully demoralizing i am sure i don't know what to say about your views you must come and dine with us some night Tuesday. Are you disengaged Tuesday? For you, I would throw over anybody, Duchess, said Lord Henry with a bow. Ah, that is very nice and very wrong of you, she cried. So mind you come. And she swept out of the room, followed by Lady Agatha and the other ladies. When Lord Henry had sat down again, Mr. Erskine moved round, and taking a chair close to him, placed his hand upon his arm you talk books away he said why don't you write one i am too fond of reading books to care to write them mr erskine i should like to write a novel certainly a novel that would be as lovely as a persian carpet and as unreal but there is no literary public in england for anything except newspapers primers and encyclopedias of all people in the world the english have the least sense of the beauty of literature i fear you are right answered mr erskine i myself used to have literary ambitions but i gave them up long ago and now my dear young friend if you will allow me to call you so may i ask if you really meant all that you said to us at lunch i quite forget what i said smiled lord henry was it all very bad very bad indeed in fact i consider you extremely dangerous and if anything happens to our good duchess we should all look on you as being primarily responsible. But I should like to talk to you about life. The generation into which I was born was tedious. Some day when you are tired of London, come down to Treadley and expound to me your philosophy of pleasure over some admirable burgundy I am fortunate enough to possess. I shall be charmed. A visit to Treadley would be a great privilege. It has a perfect host and a perfect library. You will complete it answered the old gentleman with a courteous bow and now i must bid good-bye to your excellent aunt i am due at the athenaeum it is the hour when we sleep there all of you mr erskine forty of us in forty armchairs we are practising for an english academy of letters lord henry laughed and rose <laughs> i'm going to the park he cried as he was passing out of the door dorian gray touched him on the arm let me come with you he murmured 
but i thought you had promised basil hallward to go and see him answered lord henry i would sooner come with you yes i feel i must come with you do let me and you will promise to talk to me all the time no one talks so wonderfully as you do ah i have talked quite enough for to-day said lord henry smiling all i want now is to look at life you may come and look at it with me if you care to